You're watching HuffPost Live. I'm Ricky Camilleri. He is the president of Scandal. She's starred on Homeland. And now Tony Goldwyn and Marin Ireland are teaming up to shed light on problems within our criminal justice system with The Divide, a new WE TV series based on the Innocence Project that raises awareness about wrongful convictions. Let's take a look. The execution warrant shall stand. My name is Christine Rosa. I work for the Innocence Initiative. We think that could have been a mistake. Are you out of your mind? How did you get in to see him? It doesn't matter. I got it done. He was proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. If that verdict had gone the other way, this city would have burned to the ground. He may have been guilty of something, but he didn't kill that family. How long till the execution? 17 days. Justice will not be denied as long as I am the district attorney of the city of Philadelphia. We can't afford a few days. Where did you get these photos? I can't tell you that. It was my decision and my mistake. We're going to be asking for a new trial. Don't you think it's a little cruel to offer him hope after all these years? Just don't play me to get your name in the paper. Wait! We're not becoming those people, are we? I'm joined now by The Divide's executive producer and co-creator Tony Goldwyn and the show's star Marin Ireland. Hi. Hi. What a show. Thanks. We, we yeah. can see like it. <laughs> I'm just going to tee that up for you guys, let you take it. It's incredible. I was talking to you uh, back there about this, and I feel like we have so many shows about the justice system or about the justice system on television, whether it's Law & Order or any other kind of police procedural, law procedural, but we never have anything that is like this that is about when the justice system fails. Right, yeah. I mean, what the, you know, the divide explores is the vagaries and the gray areas in the justice system. And our show, there's no, nobody's right and nobody's, if nobody's fully right, nobody's fully wrong. You know, we really look at the, in the gaps, both in the system, you know, sort of through the, through the eyes of our, our DA, um, Adam Page, played by Damon Gupton, um, and then on the other side, through Marin's character, Christine, Rosa, who is an intern at the Innocence Initiative, who uncovers this piece of evidence that calls this very big, high-profile case into question, and um, she's trying to stop an execution. And uh, but it's much more complex than that. So, yeah, we look at the cracks in the system and where it's wrong, but it's not always clear what's right and what's wrong. Now, what made you want to tell these stories? What made you you created it? You executive produced it? Where where did this come from? Yeah, for me, I made a film a few years ago called Conviction uh, with Hillary Swank and Sam Rockwell, which was uh, based on a true case of the Innocence Project, um, where a man was spent 18 years in prison for a murder he didn't commit, and his sister became an attorney after being poor and uneducated, you know, to try and get him out. And with the help of Barry Sheck and the Innocence Project, she managed to do it. So I got fascinated with these stories and these themes, and um, thought, what a you know, television is the perfect, uh, you know, gr venue to to tell a, to really explore in depth and take a kind of novelistic approach towards it. Well, like I said, you know, there, there are so many of these stories, but we rarely explore this side of the law on television. We always ex explore a sort of very black and white side. Do you think that we give audiences a kind of skewed perspective about the justice system? By yeah, I think, I think we take sort of two sides of it typically. You know, we either have the idealized, you know, prosecutors and cops of law and order. Not that that's not a great show, but, you know, you know who's right and who's wrong. Yes. No problem and no question about it. Or you have another brilliant show, something like The Shield, you know, where it's like the dirty cop. Now that show had great, you know, gray areas, and, and that's a worker. I just love The Shield. But, but at the end of the day, he's still a bad but cop. But he's a bad cop, yeah. and that's the premise of it. You know, the divide looks at it differently. You know, you think someone's bad, or you think you can take it, you know, you can judge them, and then we turn that on its ear. You know, Marin's character comes off as, seems, seems to be riding, you know, the white horse or wearing the white hat or whatever the, <laughs> the phrase is, but she's a deeply flawed, troubled human being uh, who is, you know, but, and all of the characters passionately believe that they're doing, serving justice and doing what's right, you know, as we kind of do in life. So it really looks at our own moral boundaries and our own, you know, way we all make decisions, you know, in, in big ways and in very small, subtle ways that can sometimes come back to haunt you. And I think, I mean, I think it's unsettling for people in general to think about that kind of ambiguity in, in the legal system. I, I was talking to a friend of mine about it and telling her some of the things that I had learned about, you know, um, false confessions and how often that happens and eyewitness misidentification and all of these things. And she was like, that doesn't happen. 
That right. can't happen. She literally just was like, "That I, you can't, I can't believe that that kind of thing happens because it actually threatens to sort of dismantle all of your beliefs about, you know, who's there to save you when you get in trouble." That's exactly. Well, I mean, and we that's, have stats yeah. right here. Studies mm -hmm. estimate that the wrongful conviction rate is between four and six percent, right. which means up to 136,000 innocent people are behind bars, and most of them spend 13.5 years. Yeah. Can you there. imagine? That's Can it. you imagine spending one night? in prison for a crime you didn't commit, mm -hmm. much less when you did. Yeah. But I mean, you know, yeah. but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, the, was that the National Academy of Sciences studies? Maybe, the, the, they just did a big <laughs> study on that, that <laughs> yeah, one in 25 people on death row is innocent. Wow. So that's a terrifying what did, what did you think about something like, uh, this is going off topic a little bit, but when we saw the West Memphis Three mm -hmm. uh, get released from prison a few years ago, they were given an Alford plea, which was Terrible. essentially the state I, sort of shielding themselves from any kind of lawsuit. Yeah. It's very difficult, you know, it's, to Marin's point about, we don't want, you know, why is it um, that once a decision is made, once a verdict is in, once something has been done, we don't want to go back on it. It's too painful to right. open yeah. this up. You know, we can vilify prosecutors and say, you know, th they are all bad, they're wrong, or the cops, you know, but our whole system, none of us, we want closure. We want things to be black and white. When a horrible murder or rape happens, we want someone to pay. We want to know that it's taken care of. And all of us have that impulse, which is why we're doing the divide in a way. You know, one of the things that drives it is that we have the sense of satisfaction, that we want to close the door on that. It gives us a sense of, 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 of completion. And so when that scab is ripped off again, it makes us all very unhappy. And there's pressure, political, tremendous political pressure put on prosecutors and cops that, you know, you better that's, make it that's, stick. That's close, that's close, make it stick, yeah. yeah. And you know what, here's the other truth. 99.999% of, you know, cases, it's very clear who the bad guy is. Yeah. I, you know, I have a good friend who's a, a public defender and she's like, all my clients are guilty. It's just the truth, most of my clients are guilty. So, you know, we're talking about a percentage of people that falls through the cracks, and that's a tragedy, and it's a travesty of justice. Mm -hmm. But it's because the majority of people, you know, in, in the system's overloaded, and there's a, lot, there's a lot of problems, but it's not, I just wanna be clear, we're not making a show about look at the big bad system. You know, we're, we're asking the questions and trying to, to, to... Well, and something also in our show is that pe characters like the one that I play and Damon's character, they also are some of these kinds of people that believe that everything they're doing is right. Absolutely So right. They're, they're crusaders as well who are feeling like M what I believe is the right thing to do, what I did was right. You know, so they're also characters who have kind of blinders on, which is, I think, part of what we're trying to do also. We're not presenting the main characters as people who understand those kinds of subtleties or who are willing to go back on their decisions. Right. I mean, our characters are of th this mindset that we're talking about, where their righteousness can kind of give them blinders sometimes, and they're not the kind of people that either one of them wants to go back on their word. It's so hard though, how do you set up a system where blinders don't exist, where people right. don't want to have blinders because there are so much, there's so much motivation, especially in the criminal justice system, to have blinders on, to move forward. Absolutely. Whether it's for political gain, person, uh, career gain, or it's just sort, it's just to keep moving on. Yep, and that's what the show explores. Well, exactly. it's some of the things too that, you know, the Innocence Project is looking for reform on a more basic level as well. I mean, because sometimes what that, what that means is that we need to have more kind of, uh, in interrogation rooms, people need to be more carefully monitored, things like that. We're actually taking it steps backwards and looking at things sooner than the convictions actually happen. Yeah. You know, and, and more monitoring of those kinds of things because, and that's something that I know the Innocence Project is working for. Yeah, well. it's because it's really the answer to your question is it's about consciousness. Yeah. Yes. That's what solves the problem. Oh, um, well, no, and no, sorry, asking the questions and shining a light on it. So some of the reforms you know, that, that Marin just mentioned, like having video cameras in uh, interrogation so that we can be very clear on what exactly, how something has gone down. Yeah, not you interrogating know. someone for 14 hours at a time without yeah, food. Exactly. And, exactly. Them and then down. saying to a 16-year-old kid, you know, you can go home if you just say yes. Yeah, if you're going to be easy. fine, don't worry about it, and then you get a false confession. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, and in, in the pressure that cops are under, you know, that that is all clear. Like now they have ca cameras in cars, in cop cars, and it just makes it better, you know. Yeah. Um, and then a cop, can, if he's falsely accused, can say, I didn't beat this, the, you know, I've been set up. Or uh, it works on both sides. Right, or he could say, I didn't, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> right? you, you got exactly. me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have some fans that are extremely excited for this show. Uh, video comments are coming in all over the place. I want to pull up a video comment uh, that's for you about casting uh, Marin. Let's take a mm. look at that. 
Hi, Tony, Gowen, and Marin Island. My question is for Tony. Uh, going through the audition process, looking at different actresses for uh, Christina Rosa, was it an easy process looking for uh, that character? And was uh, how did you know Marin was the woman for the role? That's a, that, thanks. That's a great question. Um, I, Marin was the one person in this cast I knew I wanted. Um, when Richard Legravene is my partner who wrote He's an incredible writer and wrote pretty much the whole show. Um, you know, when we were conceiving it and conceiving the character of Christine, I kept saying to him, this is a part for Marin Ireland. You know, I'd been wanting to work with Marin. I was, we knew each other and I was a huge admirer of her work. And I knew that she possessed the, um, <laughs> the qualities that I needed for, for Christine. Mm -hmm. You know, Christine is brilliant. She has a, a, you know, she's very charismatic, but she also is someone, and she has a kind of spine of steel, a really forceful will, but she's also very fragile and damaged and vulnerable, and I needed someone with <laughs> those, you know, qualities, and someone, you know, yeah. keen intelligence and wit, and yet also who's in trouble as a human being. So that was, the, you know, Marin, she was the first actress we had in, and that was that. Um, the other parts took a very long time to cast. We saw lots and lots of, Actors, because um, but you cast Paul Schneider from Parks and Recreation yep. yeah. and yep. All the Real Girls, who's a yeah. great That's right. actor. Clark Peters from The Wire um, yep. and Treme, who plays um, the police commissioner, who's the father of our district attorney, played by Damon Gupton. Did so you have Did you have trouble getting the show off the ground at all in terms of your presenting a sort of very, like as we said, complex gray aspect of the criminal justice system? No, that was never an issue. You know, we 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 sold the show to AMC. Um, and we made a pilot for them. So, uh, and they were all encouraging of that because they wanted to do, you know, something that was cutting edge and 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 not conventional. Um, and then we made the pilot, and they said you know, they held on to it for about six months, trying to figure out what to do with it. And they said to us, "Look, here's what we want to do. We have this other network we own called the We Network, which has up to now been reality programming and reruns of dramas. And we want to try something new. We're gonna we're gonna bring scripted programming. We want to." have sort of high-end, sophisticated, scripted shows on there, and we want to do with The Divide on We what we did with Mad Men on AMC. And uh, so we said, let's do it. And they were, once we made that decision, then they were all about, let's do something bold and original. And as Charlie Collier, who's one of the people that runs AMC, said to me, he said, look, all we want you and Rich to do is make the best show on television, and that's all we want. <laughs> that's all we ask of you. But doing, the, doing what Mad Men did on AMC, uh, what you guys are going to do for we, does that mean sort of setting the channel apart? Like, you're going to do this new big television show that's going to show that we TV is in the sort of cable drama game. Yes, that's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. And continuing to build on the audience they have, but to b broaden it out to do, you know, in addition to the fun programming they already have, what, you know, this is a whole new venture, so, yeah. Absolutely. Let's bring in uh, Gianna Collier-Pitts, who is an NYU student. She's uh, joining us live, and she has some questions. Hey, Gianna. Hi. Hi, Tony. Hi, Marin. Hi, Gianna. Um, with all the talk about botch executions, <laughs> hi. Um, um, with all the talk about botch executions and death penalty laws that has been all over the news recently, do you think that the divide will make people question their stances on capital punishment in the prison system? And did you create the show with the intention of starting a dialogue surrounding these issues? I do. Marin, why don't you take that? Yeah, um, you know, I, I certainly hope that uh, it will raise awareness <coughs> about those issues in a different way. I mean, I know it has for me. I, I certainly hadn't thought about a lot of those particulars about the death penalty or, or how executions happen in such a specific way. And I, I was really impacted by working on the show in that way. So I certainly hope we raise awareness. And that's, that's, the that's the other thing is, you know, like I was saying before, is it's about consciousness. And, um, you know, we're not telling anybody what to think. But um, by shining, a, you know, really dealing with what execution means and the possibility, you know, as we were saying before, that 4% of the people on death row are innocent. Uh, statistically speaking, how do you feel about that when you think about it now? You know what I mean? So that's, it's right. really about um, raising consciousness. It's one of those things that you're, you, you think, you know, what do you feel about it? And then you also hear someone say, well, mistakes are made. And it's like, yeah, mistakes are made. But the problem is that we're terrified of going back and figuring out that they were mistakes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the other way I would put it. You know, people say to me, and uh, I happen to be against the death penalty. <laughs> which for reasons we don't have to take the time to go into, but 
Um, no, I'm against it too. But people yeah. say to me, <laughs> were, you know were, what? Like-minded friends. What if your daughter was brutally raped and murdered? How would you feel then? And as a human being, as a man, as a father, I would want to kill the person who hurt my child. However, how would you feel if your child or your brother or sister were wrongfully accused of a murder and, and, put, and put to death and spent sometimes 10, 20 years on death row and then executed if they were innocent? How would, that, how would that feel? And what would that do to your family? So, you know, it's like, make, just let's think about it. Right. I think it's a very good question. How would I feel if someone I loved was violated in that way? What, would I, what do I believe the system should do to that person? Well, okay, let's look at through the other lens and then let's have an open dialogue looking at putting all the cards on the table. You know, so often in our society, we get entrenched in like us against them. Let's, let's build, let's, let's separate into camps. You know, our whole political system, justice, right? our like, whole political system now is just paralyzed by, well, are you with us or against us? You know, it's like you're, and it's one or the other. There's no, there's no opposite. So, you know, you're either red or you're blue and go screw yourself if you're not with me. And, and it's why we're in paralysis. And so, you know, in, 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 in telling stories, all we're doing is telling the story. So let's tell both, let's tell all sides of the story and let's talk about it because that's really interesting drama and that's entertaining too. Yeah. And in, I mean, in a system that's flawed, that's not 100% accurate, then any kind of absolute decision making like the death penalty or whatever just abs absolutely starts to feel like, well, we, if we can't rely on that to be 100% accurate, then, then we have Is to, that murder? Yeah. Right, exactly. Maybe. I want to pull in, I want to talk about this a lot more, but I want to pull in a community member who has a question as well. This is Margarita Hill. Go ahead. How are you doing, Margarita? I'm good. How are you? Uh, my question is, it seems that both of you have starred in roles dealing with politics. More specifically, Miss Ireland, your role in Homeland, and you, Mr. Goldwyn, with your role as the president in Scandal. How involved are you both in politics outside of acting? In politics, I mean, uh, personally, I'm not involved at all. I have some beliefs, but <laughs> other than that, I'm not personally involved. Tony, are you running for office? Um, I am not running for office. <laughs> Soon? Nor I think that's will awesome. I. Nor will I. Disappointing so many of your fans. I won't Tony. say yes. No. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm. Um, you know what? I'm. Been, I've spent a lot of time in Washington, and and am involved in the sense of um, more social advocacy. You know, like so. I've 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 interfaced with politicians a fair bit to um, advocate for things that I feel are important because I sort of feel like as Americans, we all have a voice and I feel like we have a responsibility to use that voice because um, we have the right to. And um, so, and because as a person in the public eye, we tend to have a louder voice that people will listen to. So I feel a certain responsibility to, to, to speak out in favor of causes that I think are like the Innocence Project or like arts education or different things that I feel you know, uh, strongly about it. And that involves d d talking to politicians. But, and I support politicians sometimes, but, uh, but um, I have no interest in being a politician. You have, a, you have no interest in being a politician, but you have interest in politics. Do you ever wish that your part on Scandal or that Scandal itself was just like a little more politically minded? Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes I do wish that because I'd be interested in some more policy-oriented stuff, but I'm not sure. A little more West Wing, right? I'm not sure the fans would. And I think that what I really love about Scandal is it knows who it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Sean Dish, it's not, it isn't the West Wing. And um, while I think we sometimes explore Fitz's political point of view on something, that's not really what the show's about. So I think we could maybe, and we probably will at times have more, but um, that's not what Sean is up to. <laughs> that's what's so great about what you get to do with our show. Also. You know, that's exactly yeah. right. I mean, The yeah. Divide is a political show, and, and in a certain sense. And, and uh, while we don't, uh, you know, we're not, we're not telling anybody what to think, we're shaking the trees, <laughs> you know, so. I don't think you're telling people what to think, but I think you are, at the very least, in the best way possible, telling people that there are innocent people out there that are incarcerated. No question about it. There's nothing wrong with telling people to think that. I agree with that. Yeah. I agree. I, absolutely. I mean, yeah, because we're not sh bashful about it either. Right. Yeah. I mean, our show is in your face in a lot of ways. <laughs> Uh, going back to Scandal, um, Laura Armstead, one of our uh, producers back here, says, Tony, what do you think Fitz is going to do when he discovers that Olivia and Jake pretty much flew off into the sun deck? Wow. Since it I, don't, I don't know. I'm so fascinated to <laughs> see what, what Shonda comes up with. Um, 
which I shall know in a couple of weeks when we start shooting. Um, uh, <laughs> I think Fitz would, um, I guess my first assumption is that he won't know that it's Jake and he'll assume something bad has happened to Olivia. That was my guess. And he will do everything in his power to, to either save her, protect her, get her back. And if he finds out it's Jake, I think he'll go ballistic. <laughs> like, <laughs> keep, he will somehow need to get her back. I, I, uh, that's, I don't Brent, know. are you a Scandal fan? I am. Although, you ever, did you go on, set, on the set of The Divide ever and ask him questions about what was happening I on did, the show? But I do have to say that the more I got to know Tony, the more awkward it was for me to watch the show than <laughs> in my free time. I was sort of, say the that, that's thing. what he told me. I was like, Tony, because I, I was watching it and then I'd show up to set and I'd feel like, Tony, how do your daughters watch this show? Because I'm starting to feel really uncomfortable about it. Wait, what are you say, uncomfortable about specifically? Um, The sex scene? I don't know if you've seen the show. There's a lot of them. <laughs> it's really, I mean, when you start to feel like family, you know, mm -hmm. as she's working every day on a TV show, and I would go, you know, I'd spend the weekend watching the show, and then I'd come back to set, and I'd feel like, this feels really weird. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so I had to take a little break while we were shooting and, and catch up on, on uh, off time, because That's it was right. a little too uncomfortable. She's like, he's putting his arm around me now. What does that mean? <laughs> I know. I, was like, <laughs> I saw you do this, and it went a lot further <laughs> last time, so maybe uh, back up. You're not up. to know what you look like with your shirt off. <laughs> uh, I want to pull in another, uh, for someone from the HuffPost Live community, Latea Ballard-Simpson, the author of More Than Pretty, who has a question for you guys. Hey, Latea. Hey there. I'm so excited to talk to you guys. Hi, Tony. Hi, Maren. Hi, Latea. I, I can't wait to see The Divide. It looks like it's going to be a great show, but I love Scandal. Your <laughs> role is so complicated, Tony. Can you share any personal, real-life experiences that have helped you prepare to play this role? Not without damaging my marriage. Um, um, well, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm a father. I'm a husband. I've been in complicated relationships. I've had my heart broken. I've broken hearts. <laughs> I've, um, you know, been in a 27-year marriage and been through the ups and downs of that experience. Um, and... Uh, you know, so, you know, as an actor, you've drawn everything you possibly can. Um, I've not been the leader of the free world, so that, that wasn't available to me. But, you know, I have played a lot of characters that worked in the White House, actually, so I did a lot of research. But in terms of my personal life, it really was drawing on my relationships and um, thinking a whole lot about crazy relationships that I've had and how that can consume and become an addiction that rules your life in many ways. But I'm curious, how has the divide played into your personal experiences? You know, I, I have to say when I, I spent about a month interning at the Innocence Project and um, it really deeply impacted me. I, I was so overwhelmed to spend time with those people and with those cases. You did everything. a month interning with them? Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah. At first I thought I was just gonna, you know, I wrote to them and was like, I'd met them for about a day before we did the pilot, we just didn't have as much time. And, and then I wrote to them and said, you know, can I come by and spend some more time? And they were like, well, you can, be an intern if you, if you want. We'll give you stuff to do. So well, I you spent. You can work here for free. If yeah, they were like, that's fine. How much time do you have? Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I have to say, it really deeply impacted me. I, I was so. Um, I, I thought it would be a profound experience, but I couldn't have imagined how much. Uh, more than that, it felt like it was, and I. I feel like I came away from that with such a, a, an intense need to tell the story that we're telling, and. Um, uh, feeling that kind of, I, I find myself talking about it to people all the time now and talking about these uh, these people that were in, uh, affected by this these situations and uh, wrongfully convicted and exonerated and wanting to spread that information as much as I can. I mean, in particular, that's like a very direct correlation. It must be so satisfying as an actor because as an actor, you are a freelance worker. You get, You have to take the jobs that come to you on a yearly, daily, whatever basis to make your money. But when something like this comes along that is a great story but also is about something meaty, that must feel so incredible and positive for it, you as an actor. It really does. I have to say I've been I've been really lucky in a lot of ways because there's been a lot of projects I've been involved with that I've been really proud of. And this one in particular is something that I could talk about all day. I mean, I, I really feel so proud to be able to, to share this information with people. Well, when you get to become an activist simply yeah. by going and doing your job, yeah. Right? That's mm -hmm. something that's really incredible. That's really the greatest thing. You know, I mean, primarily, you know, Richard's and my first responsibility and desire is to tell a great story. 
mm -hmm. and to entertain people with that story. So that, that's, that's why people tune in, you know. But if those times when you have a project that is doing that in a really great, thrilling, entertaining, shocking way, and at the same time you're raising consciousness on a critically essential, you know, uh, or a series of essential social issues and starting a real dialogue about not only the justice system, but racial politics, gender politics, marital politics, you know, um, people's latent racism and, you know, things like that that really need to be talked about. That's really the best and really gratifying. And what's fun for me is that we get to do a show about this stuff and I also get to play a character that makes mistakes herself mm. and is flawed. So I'm not also, doing. I'm not doing a show that's about social justice playing, you know, uh, this perfect, heroine, yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. Mm. I get to play someone who also is just fun on her own, separate from whatever else we're dealing with, but is a fun character who does, you know, crazy stuff sometimes and makes mistakes. So that's like kind of, uh, perfect uh, opportunity for me. Absolutely. Um, speaking of fun characters, uh, apparently next week, one in in one year, will be the 25th anniversary of Ghost. <laughs> I believe I, I'm yeah. being informed. Actually, it, we know it was actually the other day. It was July 14th. Was when Ghost opened. Was that the 25th right, well, anniversary? Was it was the 24th anniversary. 24th. So next year will be the, the 25th. Yeah. The 25th. On July. 4th. I'm, I'm being yeah. informed this by uh, how our executive am. editor <laughs> David <laughs> Flumenbaum, uh, my boss, who is a humongous Ghost fan. Uh -huh. He he loves Ghost, and he put this comment in for you. This question he said, "Took me a really long time to get over you as Carl from Ghost. He moved in on Molly after Sam's death. Did that role have any lasting impact on your career? You were such a good villain. Do you ever find people who still hate you for that?" They're beginning to forgive me. Uh, <laughs> people say because of Fitz, although Fitz doesn't always behave himself so well. But um, y y yeah, it had a huge <laughs> impact on my career. I mean, it gave me a career, really. I mean, yeah. up until Ghost, I was really sucking wind. <laughs> I mean, I was working fairly steadily, but it, it felt like I was really struggling for about six years. And then um, Ghost just suddenly gave me traction. So it, it gave me you know, momentum in my career and made sure I could support my family and all that. But I did get typecast as a villain, for sure. Well, that was such you know. a, that character was such an asshole. He was <laughs> such a purely 1980s asshole, too. There was something so specific about that decade and right. that kind of villain that, that, that I think, uh, how could you not be typecast? You played it so well. It still hurts me that you that, say that. I know. That scene, <laughs> though, where you spill the coffee, that scene where he spills the coffee on his shirt right. and then like gets to take it off. That's, oh, a, yeah. pre, that's a little pre, precursor. What about, what about, and I, I hate to do this, we're going to totally go into Chris Farley, like remember the time territory right now, but when your ghost goes up. Right, exactly, and I got sucked into hell by the bad creatures. <laughs> and I, yeah, when we, because that was, like special effects were, Talk about a black and white device there. Yeah, it was yeah. weird. And, and I remember I had to um, like do this thing, this spastic thing, and I didn't know what to do with the ghosts were dragging me away, you know. And, and the director goes, just pretend you're Elvis Costello. Like perform, remember Elvis Costello when really? he'd sing? He'd be like. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> were you a that, fan that of Costello and he knew Huge that? Huge fan. That's hilarious. <laughs> Uh, uh, one other thing uh, from the past in your career, Zev Hadesh writes in, the entire episode, Killing All the Right People, can be viewed on YouTube. Right. The speeches from Annie Potts and Dixie Carter were probably the first bit of HIV education most Americans had had at that point in the AIDS crisis. To give a little bit of a context, Zev Hadesh is a regular community member who uh, chimes in a lot in our LGBT rights mm. segments. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's a part of that community as well and is always informed and inspired. And I think essentially what he's asking here is, what was it like to be a part of that conversation so early on before yeah. it was really okay to have that conversation? It was extraordinary, really. It was one of my very first jobs. I was just auditioning as a guest star of this very popular sitcom, Designing Women. And um, the character had AIDS. And the, the Linda Blood with Thompson, who created that show, her mother had recently died of AIDS from a blood transfusion, and she wanted to talk about it. And it was a time when people weren't talking about it. President Reagan either had not yet acknowledged its existence or had just recently acknowledged it, been forced to acknowledge its existence. And people were dying, you know, and um, like a lot. Yeah. Um, and so Linda put it on primetime television for the first mm -hmm. time. So it was, um, I knew it was something important. And I played this guy who was one of their friend design, who had AIDS and went to the designing women because his family had renounced him, rejected him. And he said, I want you to design my funeral because I'm dying. And um, so it was sort of a rather lightweight treatment, but it was quite moving. And um, I, it was 
I didn't realize how um, powerful that impact would be. You know, I was really thrilled to have a job, and it was a really right. nice part. And the girl, you know, the women were amazing, the designing women. And and um, but to this day, people come up to me. I mean, it's interesting that you just got that comment because to this day, people come up to me and say, "I just want to tell you, I know you've done a lot, but that you don't know what impact that had on our community." And thank you for that. And you know, I watch and I still cry. And part of it is the remembrance of all of our friends who we lost because. Uh, you know, this terrible crisis that at that point no one wanted to talk about. Do you think falling into a role like that, that essentially, as we said before, activism, acting becomes activism just by the nature of the job, yes. has sort of influenced the way that you've moved throughout your career since then? A thousand percent. You know, I remember, this is another weird thing. Mm -hmm. Shortly after that, um, in fact, the same year Ghost came out, the next, wow, wow, we made, okay, when we made Ghost, sorry, it was that same year, 1990. I uh, w had done a play um, at the Williamstown Theater Festival the year before, in, 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 which is a summer theater festival, and I played a gay character. Uh, it was a, a beautiful play called The Sum of Us, which was made into a movie later with Russell Crowe, but um, it was about a, a relationship between a father and his gay son. It was a g wonderful play, and, and we had a big success at Williamstown with it, and they wanted to move it to New York. Now, all of a sudden, I'm in this big movie, and uh, I'm sort of hot now, um, and the, I get off at the, you know, wanted to move the play to New York. And I got all this advice, yeah, but if you play a gay character, people are gonna think you're gay. Mm. This is gonna really hurt your career. You have a chance to be a movie star, you know, and you can't do that. And I, I, I thought to myself, I said, you know, if that's the way I'm gonna make decisions, then I need, this is what I need to do. If I don't have the courage to, to do something that I believe in because I'm afraid, then I am, uh, 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 then I don't deserve to be an artist. Mm -hmm. And so that really made the decision for me that I was going to do it, and um, and the play was a huge hit here in New York. And Ghost you know, was a humongous hit. It was as a well. good. It was a good year, <laughs> 1990 for me, 1991. Yeah. You know, so but that was but that I realized it was an act of activism to publicly say, "Screw you! This is important to speak uh, about this and to put it out there." And as a straight man playing, and I and I actually got an Obie Award for it. And in the Obie Awards, I remember the way that they presented me was they said, we you know, want to thank you for being playing a gay character straight, which wow. I guess was the approach I maybe took. To, I was just being myself, you know, yeah. but it was, um, they said this was really meaningful, that it wasn't like sort of, um, you know, ghettoizing a gay character, that it was sort of making it mainstream, and it was just my interpretation of it. It had nothing to do with any political agenda. But so, yes, the answer to your question is it was an act of activism, even though I was just doing my job. Right, and you didn't end up getting typecast at all. You got typecast as the sleazy ghost villain. Exactly, <laughs> I'd much forward. rather have been you know, typecast. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, Tony, anyway. Marin, thanks so much for being here. It's been a pleasure talking to you guys. Likewise. Congratulations on the show, and I can't wait to see more of it. It's Thank really you. great. Thank you. Don't forget, The Divide premieres Wednesday, July 16th at 9, 8 central on WeTV. Click on the links below for more information on the show and on the Innocence Project, and stick around. There's a lot more coming up on HuffPost Live.